Hello and welcome to Free Code Session. My name is Jason Bach and I know I've got glasses on that look a little different than I usually have. There's a great story behind this. So I was out at MVP Summit. You saw my last episodes with Rocky as we were sitting in the hotel room and he was harassing me. So let me just make sure I actually am recording because we've always got to check that. Yes, we're recording. Okay. So go back to the code here and there. Okay. So I was getting out of the car, the, the lift ride, to the airport, and I walk in, and I had to pull some stuff out of my suitcase, um, put them in my bag, my backpack, and then I looked at, I was about to look at my phone, and I grabbed for my glasses, and they weren't there. So I thought, well, they must have just fallen, and I didn't walk that far, so I followed my path back, and they must have dropped in the car. So, and I could have, you know texted the guy and said, hey, did you, but he's probably off doing another thing. And I'm like, whatever. The, the problem is, is that, and it's a minor problem, but it's a problem that I, I really cannot see now without reading glasses. I can see normally everywhere, everywhere else, but if I'm reading or I'm doing stuff with the computer, I can't see. And if I want to, you know, so a flight going home, I wouldn't have been able to read, I wouldn't have been able to do anything on the phone, like play a game or even watch a movie, which, yes, in the grand scheme of things, that's a minor thing. But then the next day, I would not have been able to do anything on my, you know, my screen or my billing work. So I was like texting my wife back using some expletives, not to her, but just myself because I was frustrated. Could you run to a store and get, or, or to the somewhere like Target or whatever and get some 2.0 glasses. So she said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then she said, well, look around the airport. Maybe there's a place we can get some cheaters. And so I found a store, and these were literally the least dorkiest glasses that I could find for my head, or just for how it looks. And quite frankly, they look, in my opinion, rather stupid. But I'm going to do one episode with them on. I already have, my wife got my these typical, the ones that you've usually seen me with when I'm doing an episode, she also got them in bl in blue, black and blue. So now I have three pairs, and I'm going to just keep these in my bag, and just in case if I ever run into that scenario again, um, that I don't um, kind of panic. And these don't work well either. Like, sometimes if I'm, like, doing stuff on the computer from watching somebody and I look down, these don't work at all for that. I mean, they do, but the, these give a little bit more of that nice, you know, looking down and I'm looking up and then I'm looking down. And somebody could say, well, you should just get bifocals. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm going to eventually get there, but I, I'm kind of fighting that. So we're going to do the episode this way. And what I wanted to cover in this one, and i am got a timer on because I'm trying to do this over lunch and do a quick episode. So once my burrito is done, I'm going to stop the episode. But I wanted to talk about where I landed with the analyzer because in the last episode it got, you know, a little squirrely and a little kind of uh, wasn't working. So what I landed on is in the test project. If I say edit, is that I moved it to being four six one. Now you may say why. The problem that I, and I don't remember if I said, I haven't watched the videos since I uh, did them, but the problem was is that, um, no, not that one, um, it was one of these, yeah, is if I ran it with .NET Core, this wasn't always working for some methods. And I got this candidate reason, like the candidate reason was override, or not override, um, Overload, resolution, failure, and then there was an array that you, um, candidate, you know, uh, some some other property. I can't remember what it is. But you could look at that array and then, oh, the one that I was hoping to be found was there. So I came up with a workaround to just put in this code to say, hey, if you run into that case where you don't find something back, method symbol in this case would have been null, and... The candidate reason would have been overload, resolution, failure, and there would have been something in array, just pick the first one. And this is fortuitous because when I was at MVP Summit this week, 
I ran into a bunch of people from the Roslyn team to say, hey, I just ran into this. Could you help me? So it was really good timing. And they basically, we figured it out is because this project, the solution, the test project was referencing CSLA Net Standard 2.0. And so what was what was happening is when I would say for, for some of these temporary projects that I would create so I can get documents and I can get models and I can get compilations. When I'd say load the metadata assemble or the metadata reference using type object, type type, it was actually getting the runtime one system private course, something like that, which wasn't working because CSLA wanted the net standard one, but you can't get that one because that's a compile time assembly reference thingy. And so the Roslyn folks were just telling me, well, what we do is we just keep the net standard 2.01 as a hard DLL reference in our test projects, and then we just use, reference that, and so then everything works. And they're like, yes, we know, that's a hack that really feels awful, but they said there's just no other way if you have to do this to find the net standard DLL library that you need to make this all work. So I thought about it for a second. I'm like, well, could I just have the test reference 461? And then it would reference to MS Corelib, and you know, then you don't run into the scenario. And they're like, yeah, that would work too. So that's what I did. I referenced .NET for 461. I referenced the CSLA project .NET 46, and now all the tests pass. This isn't this isn't ideal. I would really like to be testing against .NET Standard 2.0. But I don't want to have in my code here for my analyzer things that are basically being done to handle a test scenario. Okay. So what I really need to do is figure out in my tests that thing that they said. How do you get it to reference Net Standard 2.0 DLL? So when you load that, that you know, when you're asking for the reference, that's the one it gives you, and just move on from that point. So and and I I think I could do it. I just was kind of pressed for time and patience, <laughs> so I just I went with this approach. So that was one of them. Let me just check my time here, see how much I have. Okay, 15. So I'm going to do, I'll talk about the other thing I ran into, and then I'm just going to go through some minor um, refactoring and then edits that I'm making in the projects and the tests. Nothing major. I just wanted to do a little bit of a cleanup. So what was the other one? The other one was, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I think it's ended up being here. Yeah, this thing is primitive. Okay, so there was a, a bug that's been in CSLA, a CSLA analyzer for like two, three years. The intent was is that the analyzer would look at a data portal operation and the arguments you're passing in there, the parameters, and saying, are they defined to be serializable? If they're not, that's a problem because reasons. You, you're gonna try to serialize over on one side values over to here and if they're not serializable then it's not going to work so we put the analyzer in to do it now when i wrote it i did have to put a little bit of a hack in there i can't remember exactly what the code was that it did but it worked on my machine famous last words but people started reporting hey this is telling me like int isn't serializable or or other things weren't serializable, and so I had to kind of step back and go, okay, what is going on here? And what I found out is the compiler API needed an API to tell you, is it serializable? And that took some time. I mean, it, it took them, a, you know, if you look at the issue on GitHub, it took some time for them to even get around to it. But even when they got around to it, I just never got back to the analyzer project updated and that's kind of what I wanted to do when I was at MVP Summit is get some of this stuff updated specifically this bug okay so I had to get I wanted to get the the project type updated so it's net standard one three which is what the template gives you now I'm there and then I can fix this bug because that one's just being hanging over my head so I put it in um, a fix we basically called dot is serializable on a name type symbol or something like that and test pass they all work, except when I would run the extensibility project here that was referencing an integration project, test project that I wrote, that 
was a Dynamic Core app. So I used the V6 as kind of a quick integration test. I'll launch after all the tests run. I'm about to submit the PR. I'll run it there and I'll just kind of do a spot check on four or five files and see do I get the red lines where I expect them to. Okay, so that's kind of cool. I was getting int to show up as being not serializable and fortunately on that Thursday another person from the Roslyn team was there. Andy is his name and I pulled him aside. I'm like what the heck? And so um, he sat down with me and he, he thought, I think it's this, and he was right. The metadata representation, if you look at them in ILDASM, for int and .NET Framework does have, the serializable attribute is actually what they call a pseudo-custom attribute, which when I wrote my applied .NET attributes book, I remember that way back in the day. Serializable is not a custom attribute. It doesn't show up in your assembly the way other attributes do. It's actually a flag in some metadata token or something like that. I don't remember exactly the details, but it's not a typical attribute the way you think of it. It's, it's a very pseudo custom one specialized for, you know, the runtime and the assembly format. Okay, great. But in .NET Core and in .NET Standard, that flag is off for some reason. Why? I Even Andy was like, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. So what we kind of landed on is this idea where you just basically say, look at the special type on the type symbol. And for these ones, these are all going to serialize. And this should handle virtually all the cases that you would run into when you're passing information over into CSLA. Um, technically, I think you could uh, serialize a couple of other things over, but it doesn't matter. The, the, this is pretty much the list. And if I need to special case other ones, I'll put it here. So I'm calling these as primitive types. Maybe I'll end up calling it as serializable types if we need to be. And he did tell me that in a couple months ago, he added something called like is primitive or is something. I can't remember what it was. But he said that would really be the thing you're looking for because those are the ones that always would be serializable. We thought about saying structs as the flag to say, yes, it would work um, because most struct types are blittable or they're, you can just pass them over and they just work. But he said not, there's cases where that wouldn't be true. Probably in CSLA would never matter, but we landed on this. That seems to work and works when I run the extensibility project for .NET Framework, .NET Core. So yay, we're good. So now I've got all that done. So there's a couple of other things I did. One, Rocky and I updated the editor config file using my editor config generator tool and we reviewed them and got that set in there. So that's in there now. So there's a lot more editor config settings. Um, I typically turn them on as error because I want to see them, even though they don't fail the build in Visual Studio right now, I think in 2019 at some point there will be an option. I've heard this for a while that this is something that's coming. It just never has. I think in 2019 it might. So Editor config errors don't fail your build just yet, but they will show up as red and errors, and that's at least more of a visual thing other than just informational things. Like if you see down here, <clears throat> there's a bunch of these for um, SysLaynet uh, 4.6, because Rocky just hasn't gone back and, and updated some of these based on the things we just set in the uh, editor config. I'm not going to change those. That's not that's not where I want to land, and Rocky can do that when he wants to. So we made that change, and now I'm just going through. Um, it's like 10.91 is the is the issue, and I'm just kind of going through the project and doing some simple cleanups, looking for where my code isn't really following editor config, and also um, just doing some changes like this one. One thing I noticed is in my test projects, I used to have this targets folder. And then there it had folders and, and c -sharp files that really were not part of the tests. I would use them to load the text within it and then compile them. Well, that became a big pain in the ass. It just was because the code wasn't in the test like what you're seeing here. Okay, And this is far easier to manage and reason about. Okay, So I got rid of all them and put them in here, but I started noticing some of them actually weren't quite right. And I think... I still haven't hit a case yet where putting the code in and simplifying it has caused a test to suddenly fail, which is, you know, maybe potentially not good for the analyzer. 
Um, so that's what I'm kind of doing right now and going through these, simplifying them, making them a little cleaner, making them a little better. Um, don't, I'm not trying to add any new features at this point, just purely going through and going, Hey, could I make this better in some way, shape or form? Okay. Like this one. Um, I need the using, I don't need the namespace. I really don't. And the, the name of the class, um, yeah. When I look down, I'm like, oh, level class A. So that should actually pass. And, and I could all do this in one line. I could actually um, not put the at thing there and make it a little string and, and stuff like that. Okay, that passed. Yay. Okay. So that's what I'm kind of doing right now. How much more time do I have? About seven minutes. So I'm just going to keep going through refactoring. One thing I notice is that CSLA doesn't like this or qualifiers in front of members. I do, which is why I did that. But Rocky said no. And my my um, my tool actually found out that that's true. But the problem is when I say remove the disqualification, well, now it says this. Sometimes it wasn't. There's sometimes where you do the light bulb and the refactoring, and sometimes it offers to do it everywhere, and sometimes it doesn't. So I just want to do it in the document for now. Say apply. And so, yay, I'm, I'm doing it the way it should be. Okay, now we should have just that. And now that actually doesn't need to be online. Actually, has using one node, has using statement. Has using one node, does not have using statement. Oh yeah, because it should be false, you don't have it, okay. Um, oh well, yeah, that's right, I'm just testing the extension here. So I really don't care. And in fact, if I really wanted to, I could just say, Put that. Nah, I'm going to keep it this way. We'll keep it. Actually, though, I should come back up here. I'm trying to do the expression body members everywhere that I can. Rocky likes that too, so we're going to try to start enforcing that everywhere. Okay, so this one we need system because we have we don't need a namespace. And pull that back. This is actually kind of fun this way because it forces me to think a little bit about how the code really should be. Um, if I don't have all the IntelliSense and everything kicking in, I don't. So it's like, huh, that might not actually work. You know, that might fail. And look, it failed. That <laughs> won't fail. It's not null fail. Okay, well, what, what, what's not null there? Public grid, new grid. Oh, find parent. Hmm, that's that doesn't make any sense. What am I doing here? I'm parent where parent type exists. Invocation node. Oh, I'm looking for a... Bl okay, so I find... And there is no... Um, there is no... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in this case, if I go to the syntax visualizer the syntax visualizer. <sighs> the syntax visualizer. Okay, so that's an invocation expression there. And its parent is an arrow expression clause. So in this case, it should be an arrow expression clause syntax. So now that should actually work because it will find the parent. And it does. Okay, that's good. Just took me a second to get my head around. And again, we don't have to call these um, any special names. That's another thing I was trying to say. You know, because I would match these by looking things up, and, and it was just like, what in the world am I doing here? That was just stupid. Okay. So this is saying... Just less strings. 
less strings in your code, less string sizes. This should still be true because you're looking for an await expression and that doesn't exist from the invocation. That's not the parent. And that's true. Okay. Is my burrito done? About three minutes left. Okay. Find parent when parent is null. Okay. And then we really don't even need this, right? And then we don't need that at all. Yeah, because the root doesn't have a parent, so that should be true. Okay, so that's good. So that's all cleaned up. Okay, look at that. Look at that. Look at just look at that. Would you look at that? Holy crap! I'm hungry. I want food. Okay, so what we really want this to be is a where it's a, and then we have a private a. And I don't think, see, some of these tests were actually looking for the names of things. So, as I just said. And it fails. Okay, why does it fail? Their exception. Public class A, private A, and A, the, the. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I need a CSLA. That, see, that's the other thing here, too, is that I was always assuming at times that because they were in the right namespace, the CSLA would just work. I don't know if that's going to fix this. It doesn't. That's not quite... Um, Okay, this, oh, this was the last one. I'll say this quick and then I'm going to have to get my burrito. This is the last one. In this test, what I also found out is when we would run it in AppFair, because they would run on Rocky's machine, they would run on my machine, but when they ran in AppFair, we were getting these weird things where the change text for the code fix was like off by spaces. It wasn't exactly what we were looking for. So we decided to say, let's just kind of tokenize it a little bit and say, what I'm really look caring is, did this show up? in the change text. That's really what I care about, okay? So, so I'm like, okay, cool. And so we changed all those and then it all worked. So I had to do a, a little bit of a test there. Just the fun things that you find out that didn't work in the text box, the test box, and we really don't know why. I mean, it wasn't clear at all why that was gonna work. And quite frankly, I didn't wanna dive into those bottles. I was just really concerned about, does the, there's my burrito, does the change text look like kind of what it should be? And if we find that, that's good enough. The spacing is not that important. Okay, so that's all the time I got for now because I'm going to go eat lunch. So the next episode, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. We'll figure it out. Maybe I'll get into some rock stuff. Maybe I'll do some other things. Who knows? But there's definitely a lot to work on. So thank you for watching. Leave comments and questions below. See you in the next episode.